right, I think we're ready to roll. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Roz Roseboro. I am a senior analyst at Heavy Reading, uh, covering the Telco Data Center, and I am thrilled to have uh, this panel today to talk about the Swisscom PaaS deployment. Um, I find it's always really interesting to hear from a user who has actually had some experience with this so we can uh, you know, see what it's really like to, to use some of this new technology and get some insight into uh, some of the lessons that they learned, some of the challenges they faced, and uh, more importantly, what some of the business outcomes were. So uh, just by way of quick introduction, I will have you guys each introduce yourself over here, and then I'll hand over to Marcel, who can give us a little bit of a kickoff. So start with the right. Hello. Uh-oh. Hello. Yeah. There we go. So I'm uh, Pedro Monclus, uh, CTO at PlumGrid. Uh, we provide an SDN solution for OpenStack, and we are here to discuss about how the network had some role on this uh, Swisscom project. Uh, Chip Childers, I'm with the uh, Cloud Foundry Foundation. Um, we're the, the home of the multi-founder development around uh, the Cloud Foundry platform. Uh, I'm Chris Wright, Chief Technologist at Red Hat. Yeah, and so I'm Marcel Harry. I'm leading the um, architecture of Swisscom's Elastic Infrastructure as a Service and the Platform as a Service. So maybe we just jump into how that looked like. So we have on the top, um, we have Cloud Foundry, which powers our application cloud. So this is our platform where we drive innovation by enabling developers to easily push new applications um, to the cloud. We are a certified Cloud Foundry provider, and we're usually amongst the first ones delivering new Cloud Foundry versions to our users. Um, this platform we build on top of OpenStack, obviously, as we're at an OpenStack conference <laughs> summit. So, um, and there we have, as a basis, we have the Red Hat OpenStack platform providing us all the APIs and the base functionality for our infrastructure as a service, which we called our Elastic AAS. And then we got PlumGrid, which we use as our plug-in within Neutron as our SDN driver, um, which does not only give us all the Neutron capabilities, but also allows us to go way beyond um, what you can do with standard Neutron. And then when we look a little bit more about the use cases that we got on top of um, the stack, we have, for example, Dorma Kaba, one of the world leading security and access um, devices manufacturer. So they are now building on top of our application cloud, they are building a new innovative platform to manage their devices. And they are really the kind of customer you would like to get because they, they were the ones that saw the potential of the platform and then started pushing us to new levels of what people expect that you can do with this platform. We have also our, <clears throat> we have also our public offering, developer.swisscom.com. Anyone can do go there, sign up, and push, instant, uh, push applications, uh, application instances immediately. So everyone here in the room could go there and sign up. And for sure, we're not only providing these platforms to our customers, but we're also using them internally. So we really believe in, in what we're building here. And so we have also leveraged an internal application cloud that provides our, our thousands internal developers an easy way to get started, but also leveraging access to legacy backend systems. And an example of that is the service MyCloud, which is a cloud storage-like service that is offered to all our residential customers. And here at the summit, we're actually able to make an announcement. Um, so the world's largest reinsurance company, Swissre, is going um, with us, Swisscom, 
um, on their journey to the cloud, and they're using this platform here, the application cloud, to deploy new applications in a cloud native fashion. This is going to be live tomorrow morning, but I was allowed to make the announcement here as well. Thanks, Marcel. Okay. Switch over. Okay, well, first, what I'd like to do is ask uh, the technology providers a little bit if you can give us just a little bit more insight into what each of your respective platforms or, or solutions were uh, you know, in the context of this particular appointment. So, again, I'll start over at the end with Paray. Hello. Yeah. <clears throat> so, it, it was a very interesting project because essentially when uh, we first met Swisscom, they came with the idea that they wanted to transform their company into uh, the cloud. They wanted to understand what would it mean in terms of their business to move their customers, their large enterprise customers into a cloud kind of technology. And uh, they came with the idea of creating kind of an interdisciplinary team. So from a vendor point of view, it was an unusual relation because basically we had all the people that understood from the physical network to the storage, to the compute, to the application, in this case, the, the past layer with Cloud Foundry. And it was very easy to essentially create this collaborative uh, initiative where we would discuss what it means in terms of, uh, specifically to plan it from a networking point of view, uh, how to eliminate uh, with some of the folks in the audience the, the villain problem into their fabrics. And then after that, how to create a proper addressing scheme and how to provide a proper security infrastructure and so on. But the good thing was that uh, we could essentially have access to a very deep discussion, not only with Swisscom, but with all the other partners in the, in the project. And that created kind of a very uh, agile and, and deep definition of what we wanted to achieve. And in there, basically, we learned a lot. As a vendor, was not only what we were giving to the project, but what we were learning from uh, everybody else, from Swisscom and from all the other vendors. And uh, that, I think, it created a much uh, robust uh, architecture in the sense that we learn the implications on networking for Cloud Foundry and split DNSs and things like that. So that, I think, was, was the experience where everybody provided their technologies, but at the same time, the willingness to adjust and to collaborate to fulfill a vision that essentially Swisscom was bringing together uh, by setting certain goals and certain expectations. So in this sense, it was a pretty amazing experience. And from our networking perspective, uh, or a virtual networking perspective, what we brought is the ability to essentially connect multiple workloads, being VMs or containers, and segregate them into certain spaces to provide the proper security and connectivity elements of the project. So I always feel a little bit like the oddball at infrastructure conferences because um, the Cloud Foundry story is actually very application developer centric and it, it's, um, it's focused on optimizing that experience. And so in order to do that, we rely on you know, a stable OpenStack platform, stable networking underneath it. Um, but we're, our, our technology is very much about how do you take a developer and help them iterate faster? How do you actually move fast um, but do it safely, right? Through rapid iteration, um, making sure that all of the, what I consider to be kind of the atomic building blocks of good application lifecycle um, are, are built into the platform and then they're easily strung together uh, in a way that lets you do complex rollouts, like um, you know, whether you're gonna do canary node bit style deployments, you're gonna do um, you know, red green deployments, and it's all kind of optimized around that application. And you know, the, the Cloud Foundry challenge is that when you push a single application, you know, that's really, really easy. It gets a little bit more complicated when you talk about real world systems that involve multiple microservices talking together. Um, how do you coordinate all this together? And I think just as importantly, how can um, a, a platform that works at the application layer effectively communicate with systems that we might call legacy, even though they're virtualized, right? They're, they're not bespoke applications. They exist today within uh, VMs running in an OpenStack environment. Um, how does a Cloud Foundry environment actually interact effectively with, with higher level services that, that might be provided by OpenStack underneath it? Um, so that's kind of the, the perspective that the CF brings to it. And we're lucky enough to have uh, Swisscom be one of the early adopters of CF. Um, they're also a member of the board of, the, of our foundation. And, um, and as Marcel said, they, they move very quickly. Um, we, on average, release a coordinated release of, of Cloud Foundry software once every two weeks. Um, that's pretty rapid, right? Um, in fact, if we could speed that up a little bit, we, may, we might like to. 
Um, and that's a, that's a fairly complex system. And so, you know, providers like Swisscom that, that stay very close to the leading edge is very useful for us. I think this works. Uh, so I, I think Perry was, was putting it well in terms of a big component of this, the success of this project was about the early stage collaboration and bringing direct customer requirements and vendors together to do, um, to, to understand we're, what are we building. So from a Red Hat point of view, we're, we're providing OpenStack. Um, I don't know if anybody here knows about OpenStack, uh, but uh, a couple, there's a couple of people, okay. Uh, so, you know, obviously we're providing the low-level platform infrastructure for, for, for this application platform for, for Swisscom. And a key integration point for us was working with PlumGrid to in, ensure that the networking requirements were met from our point of view, which is providing Neutron as, as essentially a, a tenant-facing API that's pluggable and the plugin coming from PlumGrid and, and then the rest of PlumGrid's infrastructure uh, building out the networking solution. So I think since we're at the OpenStack conference, the, the, the OpenStack pieces are pretty straightforward. And, and again, the, that critical kind of relationship where we start early, we understand what we're doing, we have engineers directly involved trying to, to, to build something is, is, some, is what makes projects like this successful. Thanks, guys. Um, I want to ask Marcel, um, what surprised you the most as you were working through this deployment? Were there any you know, significant you know, challenges that you anticipated that didn't happen or things that you didn't anticipate that did happen? Any you know, significant barriers you had to overcome? I realize that's quite a lot of questions, but I'd like to get your thoughts on how this whole process worked. So I think like one of the most amazing parts was how quickly we were able to move forward because um, if you look at how things are currently being developed, like two weeks re uh, release cycle, I think keeping up with that pace is, is, um, is quite amazing. And it's usually also amazing to see how, how like if you bring people together as, as we did as part of that um, project, it will start become very quickly um, so problems will resolve very quickly. One, and one, an example is, for example, we, we kind of started using um, uh, Cinder in a way how maybe no one else used it before. And then we really hit corner um, edge cases, box between Nova and Cinder, and while having direct access to, to developers working on this particular project really helped solving the problem um, very quickly. And then also we had to be able to deliver these new developments um, very quickly. So um, th I think that the pace, how we're still going on, that's the, really the amazing part. Thanks. Um, wanted to ask you, Pere, about was there anything particularly un unique or challenging about this particular deployment? I know you guys have been doing this for a, for a little bit. Was there anything unique to this particular implementation? I mean, all, all the projects have something unique. <clears throat> in here has been essentially this notion of uh, what's the role of the network. And uh, traditionally, people would think, oh, it's to connect point A to point B. But in this case, it was more like a sense of uh, providing to the virtual elements whatever uh, they need to provide in terms of connectivity, switching, routing, NAT, uh, security policy, and so on, and isolating from the network but in a way that would be very flexible. And this uh, sometimes is kind of more the mindset of, of companies like middleware, basically where you have certain uh, endpoints that expect certain things and certain requirements from a network and the other things, and the ability to essentially adjust whatever requirement comes. And what was surprising to us is this notion that, especially me coming from a traditional networking background, seeing the true meaning of that the network is much more than connectivity, and working towards going up the stack. Going up the stack and solving one problem after the next after the next in the sense that there's no true solution just providing uh, simple networking elements. You have to provide what we call now a networking suite, a collection of networking technologies to address whatever the applications uh, drive uh, the requirements. And this was this new encounter with the meaning of cloud. Uh, because until now, a lot of uh, IT departments in traditional companies, they segregate networking from storage, from compute. But what we saw is that within a true cloud stack, there's no these artificial boundaries. It's like problems keep coming or new architectural decisions have to be taken. 
and each component has to truly adjust to the needs of the full stack. And this probably was kind of the, the biggest realization of working with Swisscom in this project. Little bit about um, how uh, the Cloud Foundry platform, um, kind of a little bit more about the relationship between that platform and the underlying OpenStack platform. I think that might be interesting for some of the folks yeah, in the audience. Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, Cloud Foundry is actually um, two platforms in sort of one industry movement. Um, we've got the traditional platform as a service experience, which we call the Elastic Runtime, um, and a lot of other bits that support it. Um, but underneath it is this layer that we call Bosch. B-O-S-H. Um, Bosch is, if I can sum it up, uh, it is a tool designed specifically for distributed systems release engineering. That's kind of a mouthful, right? It's got attributes of configuration management. Um, it has specifically a, a plug point uh, called the CPI, or Cloud Provider Interface, that's designed to work with um, any number of, of different options for what the infrastructure might look like. And in most cases, we're talking about infrastructure as a service. In this case, specifically OpenStack, um, we, we happen to have plugins that work with directly with vSphere um, or, or public cloud providers like Google, Azure, Amazon. Um, the most important integration point today, and this is, I think, going to change a little bit in the future, um, the most important integration point today with OpenStack is that, is that CPI layer. Um, we've been really fortunate, too, to have a lot of users um, that work very specifically on making sure that, that integration works very well. Um, as you all know, there's, uh, in, the, in the past of OpenStack, there had been a lot of variation in what does it mean to actually be an OpenStack-based cloud, right? Uh, so that's a big area that uh, the Cloud Foundry Foundation's looking to address but I think most importantly, the work that's occurred within the OpenStack community around RefStack is, is really important. Um, we, we actually have some experimental work going on right now that's taken the, the basic kind of Tempest test suite um, that was built into RefStack and build a series of tests that can be run through the same infrastructure that allow you to, to confirm that CF is going to deploy and operate and be operated um, well on any particular OpenStack target. Uh, so that, that's the most important integration point for us. Now, there's, there's some futures where up in that elastic runtime layer, I mentioned this earlier, when different application microservices need to communicate well with each other, um, while we want to keep the developer experience really simple, um, in fact, extremely simple, there's a need to kind of pierce the veils of abstraction a bit uh, to make sure that if you have a need for connectivity between different services, that you know, we're doing that in the most efficient way. And that's going to require kind of bubbling some of those abstractions all the way down, you know, to, to the SDN layer. Okay, great. You, know, you were talking about some future-looking things. I was actually going to ask Chris about that, about, you know, from a developer standpoint, um, you know, are there some things that you can speak about that will get them excited about looking about what you guys are, are doing to, to enhance or extend uh, things in OpenStack? Well, from a developer point of view, um, I mean, Red Hat has a very broad uh, kind of technology view of the world. And from a developer point of view, uh, we provide a bunch of developer middleware components and toolkits. And, and specifically, we actually have uh, a application, you know, contain, microservice container application orchestration system that would be something that's competitive in the market with, with Cloud Foundry called OpenShift. So all, most of our focus from uh, working with developers is, is in that context. And for us, that means we're building um, tooling around enabling uh, Docker images as your core service, and Kubernetes as the orchestration system, combining combining your you know making an an application out of composing or aggregating all of these different services together. So that's that's our perspective, and in terms of where we're putting our focus on building developer tooling, uh, of course we have a lot of middleware. Uh, so it's an interesting world right now where. The legacy applications are, are, are well understood. It's, it's often Java applications running in enterprise application platforms. Um, that's something that we provide. We're also looking at how we can bring that, those concepts as services into a, a PaaS uh, into a PaaS system. So that as a developer, you can consume services without having to take on sort of the legacy model of, of what looks more like a monolithic application. Uh, now, those are all slightly out of scope for what we're talking about here, except that it's, um, it's very much solving similar problems. And, um, and you know, I think these are, these are the problems that are really interesting for the industry right now. And this, these are what people are trying to 
trying to, to migrate to, or get away from uh, the, the models that we've, that we've been working with for the past decade and move to uh, you know, the next round of, of application development. Thanks. So Marcel, um, so what advice would you give to, uh, to your peers here about um, you know, people who might be thinking about deploying something somewhere? What is, what is uh, some of the things that you learned that would be useful to them? I think um, start small. Um, start quickly and iterate quickly. I think this is like we kind of try, um, we kind of took that approach. Maybe we could have even been started even smaller and even quicker, but nevertheless, it was very good to um, put an infrastructure very early into um, so called beta phase of. Um, of availability where people were able to test things out. So um, within weeks, we um, delivered um, the first stack running everything on top. And then within months, we went into some kind of beta production, which where we clearly said this infrastructure is not yet ready, but here it is to, to go and play around. And from that, we also gained a lot of feedback and we saw use cases of people how they were using the platform, which we didn't expect. And so we were able then to take that feedback back and iterate it more and adjust things um, um, accordingly. So something that we, for example, did was we, we uh, brought in that notion of a, a Black Friday where we said, OK, every Friday we're just going to hack on, on the platform itself, and it will be unstable on that day. And, and on the other days, um, you should be able to try things out, but this is um, the day that we're rolling new things out. And at the moment, we're like, we're really in a, I mean, we have also a bunch of services on top. Um, and so besides the two weekly um, release cycle of, of Cloud Foundry, we, we, we still roll our own weekly release cycle where we also push the development of our value-added services out to um, to the people and and making it that like from the beginning on very um, quickly is kind of I think a key because then you can adapt way faster than um, just being in 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 the dark for two years and then you come out and no one wants it the way how you thought it should be. It's, it's interesting you say that. I was actually going to have one more question that I don't think I told you I was going to ask. Um, but it, it occurred to me when I was listening to, to some of the keynotes this morning about um, the fact that success with OpenStack, like most other things, is one part technology, nine parts people in process. And I'm curious, you know, you know, does that resonate with you guys? Because in my experience, that has certainly been the case. And I don't know that it's going to be any different here, but I'd be interested in what, what your thoughts are. And then after this, we'll open it up to, uh, to audience questions. I'm guessing you guys have a few things you might want to ask, too. Yeah, I think um, that um, people are a very important part of the process because it's um, we're moving away from how we used to build IT and how we used to run IT in the past. So like this very fast pace changes a lot of the roles that have been um, there for, for years. Um, it also changes the way how you deploy things, how you build things, how you life cycle things. And um, it's important that people are onboarded there very early and getting yeah, taken with on that journey through um, in, in that migration or in that, in that transformation towards a more um, DevOps um, cultured approach and, and also um, yet yeah, being in, in a more CI/CD um, driven approach where things are pushed automatically, are tested automatically, um, and then validated and, and accepted to um, the next stages. Uh, so we, we see this all the time. Uh, almost, almost every encounter we have with customers, the technology choices are you know, there's, there's some questions there, there's some challenges, how, how easy it is, is it for us to adopt the actual technology? And uh, the, the process and organizational challenges 
are significant. And we actually talk through that with our customers right up front, saying that this, you know, you, we've got our technology. It's a, it's a small part of the picture. We have what do you need to do to consume this technology as an organization as really the more uh, kind of challenging problem to solve. And some concrete examples are even in, in, in this context where you're talking about networking and, and, and networking not only uh, over the top of the physical fabric, but what's the relationship between virtual machines and containers. In an organization, you typically have silos, and, and there's a group that owns the network, and there's a group that owns the servers. And we, we thought, great, we've got clouds. Clouds kind of break down some of those barriers, and we can have simple policies that ride on top of the physical fabric so that we don't have to go ask the network operations teams for permission to do things. And turns out, that's actually not true. Uh, you still need to go talk to the network people because you're using what they're managing and they're looking at this from the perspective of what security compliance and, and you know, a whole set of, of availability agreements that they've made with the organization that might look compromised to them. And so it's this, this people process organizational shift is, um, it's really important. It's not just technology. So hopefully um, a number of you are familiar with the, the concept of Conway's law, right? It's that um, any system that you're building will end up being a, uh, uh, a model that matches the communication paths through your organization, right? So that's, that's one of the laws that we've all kind of learned in technology, um, in particular in the application development teams, but I think the exact same thing applies to the way that you build platforms, uh, infrastructure style platforms. Um, one, one of the ways that, that I think about how technology relates to organizational transformation and then how you kind of use iteration to, uh, to change quickly is that platforms fundamentally are about making promises to their consumers, right? And, and, if, and a good platform is also going to constrain the choice that a consumer has. So that consumer knows what's in the box and what's outside of the box. And that's actually a really, um, it's a freeing feeling. If you've got all the options in the world, anybody ever gone into a restaurant that's just had way too much on the menu, right? You have a hard time picking what you want for dinner. Um, but if you constrain it just right, not too much, then you actually get freed up to make a decision quickly. And maybe you, you, know, you try more food then because you're gonna just quickly decide the next time you go there that you're gonna pick something else. Um, maybe my analogy is a little bit flawed, but, but the general idea being that, you're, that the, the more that platforms are able to support uh, constraining their consumers, the easier it is for then the team that supports that platform to know uh, that they're actually fulfilling the promises that they're trying to fulfill. Yes, and maybe following the analogy of the restaurant, <clears throat> I think what's going on is that uh, we all got used to be very good at certain topics. And now the question is, when we go one level up, um, there's a resistance in the people because uh, concepts that are not familiar to the area of expertise that we all uh, manage, now get stretched. And the choice becomes a little bit higher, but now my influence and my capabilities become much broader. And sometimes, as humans, we want to have control of little things. When we go one level up, the analogy of the restaurant, if there are too many choices, then we don't know what to choose. So we need some sort of an abstraction that now, instead of uh, letting us pick the plate that I'm going to have for dinner today, now I can organize a dinner for 100 people because now I can essentially choose two options, uh, decide what type of tables I'm going to have, what type of cloth, and so on. And the usefulness of infrastructure as an abstraction is this, is how do we, the people involved in technology, become more effective? And we've seen this going from in the computer science world programming from assembly to high level languages and things like that. But essentially is this kind of compromise that as we go higher in the stack, uh, we become more effective. And the tools that we have to provide in order to succeed in this cloud transformation is that, is not to get caught in certain uh, details that are going to make uh, these complex frameworks even more complex, but rather than to provide the proper abstractions that with uh, less time, less people, we can do more so we can focus on the things that matter. And this is kind of this transformation that we have to go from specialization to more uh, generic and a generalist understanding of technology and then we all become more empowered, more effective. And this is the transition that I think the cloud is bringing to the, to the IT industry. Great, thank you. So now we've got about seven minutes or so left. Are there any questions in the audience? I can't see, oh, there's one over there. Uh, Rene Buisson, Chris Research. Hi. The question to Swisscom. Um, your application cloud 
On which technology is it based? I think not OpenStack, because then you would mention it, right? Um, I mentioned it before. It's based on Cloud Foundry. So we're a certified Cloud Foundry provider. And okay. um, the application, like, we're fully, so to be certified, you need to be fully, a, not only, but you need to be fully API compatible with what um, the open source project Cloud Foundry provides. So this is what um, we're based on. And, and the infrastructure layer? The infrastructure layer that um, is used to deploy that platform is OpenStack. Okay, good. So actually there was, uh, there was this slide here which should make it um, clear what we're based on. Anybody else? Oh, another one here. You mentioned additional services above and beyond Cloud Foundry. Are any of those services based on OpenStack technology, like VMs or containers? And how do you expose those to your customers? So um, this is something that I think Cloud Foundry solves really well. Cloud Foundry really takes the approach of um, running cloud native applications and then leverages a well defined API to bind services to your application. And these services, they can be implemented however you want to implement them. And what, um, what we did is we took an approach um, where we built. Um, a stateful services platform that is based, um, that is using Docker as a technology to quickly spawn containers and then uses uh, Flocker, a plugin that talks to Cinder um, to provide the persistency for these containers while keeping them easily movable around um, on, on VMs. So um, the services are either like standard OpenStack VMs or are um, Docker containers powered um, where the persistency is powered using uh, Flocker. And then maybe something else is, I mean, Cloud Foundry is, 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 a, is a platform that um, that is based or is an open source project, so it, it kind of like works together with, with all the different involved parties to make one project. And for example, what we see a lot is integrating um, an open source project into various enterprise environments for virtual private instances. It usually requires some kind of integration with their system, whether it's authentication, whether it's their network, and these things. And these are all the value added services that we put on top um, of, of um, the standard open source um, platform and wherever possible we feed them back into the project itself. Yeah, uh, Mike Ernesto with uh, Verizon. Uh, question uh, on the networking piece. You mentioned that that was integral, kind of linking the two, uh, the two layers, uh, the pivot on the and the OpenStack. Was PlumGrid a, an integral part of that, or are there other, uh, you know, other network options that might be uh, part of that to get to, to reach certification with the Cloud Foundry? Yes, there's multiple aspects. Uh, <clears throat> PlumGrid, we provide an environment that we call a virtual domain that encompasses an application, basically surrounds the application based on uh, identity-based policy. And based on who you are, you can connect to the network or not, and then there's different features in networking. And the next, what we provide is uh, uh, security groups uh, based on uh, certain parameters that go beyond some of the, the criteria that uh, OpenStack provides. And now we are working with the Cloud Foundry Foundation in the open source community to expose some of those concepts as part of a collaboration with Swisscom, Cloud Foundry, and Plumgrid and other members. Uh, what we want to go from making it kind of a, a tailored solution for an OpenStack, Cloud Foundry, Swisscom environment to have the ability to make it uh, part of Cloud Foundry deployments, regardless if PlumGrid is present or not. And for that, we are using a, a project, a Linux Foundation project called IOVisor, that allows us to essentially extend the capabilities of the network layer within the, the kernel of Linux and uh, completely open source. So that's 
uh, from a plumbing point of view, we have solutions that we are deploying with, with this project and others, but then we are working with the community to try to have a, an open source implementation of similar concepts. Any, any, uh, oh, one more. Uh, it's a question again for Swisscom. Uh, Red Hat also has its own open uh, uh, pass solution, OpenShift. Did you consider this and why didn't you choose OpenShift and instead of then a Cloud Foundry? Frankly speaking, what was the decision against OpenShift? Um, that was before my time. <laughs> <laughs> Over here. I mean, well, maybe maybe let's not answer that particularly in that direction, but taking it more away is, I think at the moment we have a huge bus within uh, the, uh, the container um, environment and platforms there um, are way more than just scheduling your applications. And this is what the two projects provide and one of um, one is OpenShift and the other one is Cloud Foundry. And I, I think at the moment these are the two big platforms that um, are around as open source projects. While then if you go down a little bit, you see that within the whole middleware layer, you, um, that, that is actually orchestrating the containers, there is still a lot of bus around, still a lot of things being tried out. So I think it's actually, a, um, in general, it's, it's, something that is still moving very quickly and, and a lot of things will, will still change at the moment. Okay. I think we've got time for one more. Uh, just a sorry. quick oh, question. Uh, oh. Might be a yes, no question, but is there like a scaling feedback loop between Cloud Foundry and the infrastructure service layer? Sorry, I was disturbed. No, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. can, can you repeat the question? It, yeah, the, the question is, is there a, like a scaling feedback loop between Cloud Foundry and uh, the OpenStack service? So in general, um, there's Bosch who's deploying Cloud Foundry on top of OpenStack and, and there you have means to hook into um, these features, but maybe that's more a question for Chip. Do you, when you ask the question, do you mean is, is it automatically growing unbounded? Or yeah, yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> there is some work that's going on um, to to think about. So because Bosch is a platform in and of itself, right, and it, it 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 solves a set of problems, and it isn't it isn't really all about the developer. It's actually about release engineering. Um, th there is some work going on right now to think about how it can be more intelligent um, and have some logic coded into it to allow its jobs. Um, for which the elastic runtime of CF might be one of those jobs. Um, MySQL services, you know, all kinds of different capabilities might be a job. Um, to allow that job to scale based on demand. Uh, to do that effectively, though, it's not as simple as, as just auto scaling based on, based on, I don't know, traffic or, uh, you know, memory utilization. It's actually, you have to deeply understand the, um, the internals of the, the individual cells in that elastic runtime cluster. Um, but there is some thought going into it right now. Right, unless there's anything else, I think that's just about our time. Oh, one more. Sure. Um, can the concept of um, distribution, like you have Red Hat, has an open stack distribution? Is there, there seems to be a concept of license problem where <coughs> uh, open stack or a cloud battery is licensed that prevents people like uh, Red Hat from being distributed? Is that going to be addressed or what's happening to the ability for someone like Red Hat, Canonical, uh, as you say, so, so I don't believe there's a licensing problem. So I work for a foundation. I don't work for a vendor. Um, all of our software is licensed via uh, the Apache Software License version 2. Um, there are today seven certified distributions or providers right now um, from Pivotal, um, Pivotal, HPE, um, IBM, Swisscom, CenturyLink, I mean, just a good, good number of them. Um, and there's also, there's more that haven't been certified yet, and there's also a lot of use of it uh, that's happening just based on, you know, free open source use. Um, cloud.gov is a great example. So cloud.gov is um, something that the, the uh, U.S. federal government's GSA launched to support the transformation of agencies. Typically on that, my understanding is a legal issue is Red Hat can't send me a disk or a 
set of binaries that includes this. Maybe give me a link where I can go to um, Pivotal or to someone else to grab that content. But my understanding is a legal issue I'm going to play Bob Evans is that um, other companies cannot actually distribute your binary. They have to take a look at They can't actually provide you a fish. I'm not familiar. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not familiar with that either. I mean, it's, it's all we, GitHub. Uh, Red Hat as a company. I guess you're getting perplexed looks from two people who should know the answer. So <laughs> I, I'm going to go with inaccurate FUD for, for, for record, 10. We look forward to Red Hat offerings, yeah, as a, as a commercial distribution. Anything you'd like to. We welcome them to the party. <laughs> All right. Well, and that's I thought I would mention that OpenShift does do auto scaling and OpenStack. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. So thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the show.